So she starts out by being this priestess, the God's wife of Amun. She's there alongside her father, the king, Tutmosis I, in arcane rituals, and she has to be educated for this position. So we're talking about a young girl who's working with priests and tutors, making sure that she understands the mysteries of the temple. This girl understands how ideological power can make or break a king. She's growing up <laughs> smelling incense, listening to the chanting of priests, watching the sun slant into the temples. She, she understands how you can use power and display it to people as a God-given right, something that you cannot argue with, something that you can't take away. She marries her half-brother, Tutmosis II. She's queen alongside him. She has a daughter with him, no son, and then he dies. And we hear from a courtier who records this in his tomb. This is the situation as soon as that man died. So we'll, we'll read. We'll have a little close reading moment, a little teaching moment. <laughs> Tutmosis II went up to heaven and he united with the God, so he's dead. His son was raised in his place as the king of the two lands. And notice they don't even mention the name of the son as Tutmosis. They just say his son. He ruled upon the throne of the one who begat him. So the succession is continuing. You see our lineage from father to son. But then you see something interesting. His sister, and this would be Tutmosis II's sister, the God's wife of Amun Hatshepsut, fulfilled the needs of the land. The two lands following her counsel. She was served. Egypt was obedient. We picked a 16-year-old girl. The queen, the god's wife of Amun, educated elite to be sure. We picked a 16-year-old girl to act as regent on behalf of this boy. And everyone's doing what she says. Everything's fine. Egypt is obedient. We have no trouble. You'll see that the granaries are working well. The upper Egypt is doing well. Lower Egypt is doing well. Now, Head down to the bottom of this text, and we see one of the mechanisms that Hatshepsut and her entourage, any 16-year-old girls can have an entourage to help her pull this off, right? How they're actually going to make this happen. Her majesty praised me, and she loved me. She knew my excellence in the palace. She provided me with things. She made me great. He's boldly saying, she's making me rich. She's giving me stuff. She's paying me off. <laughs> there's maybe, there's, maybe it's not as elegant to say, you know, she's bribing people or paying people, but Hatshepsut and her entourage, they know they have to give to get. They have to let more cash, more wealth, leave their treasuries and enter into the hands of their elites and their courtiers. It's an interesting thing if you're an Egyptologist and you deal with the 18th dynasty and you deal with this period, and you look at the tombs and the statues of the elites from before this moment and the statues and the tombs of the elites after this moment, the difference is stark. Before, during the reign of her father, there were some tombs and some statues, and they're kind of okay, and there's not too many, and so you see the level socioeconomically of these elites. Then Hatshepsut comes along, and boom! Amazing statuary, huge tombs, excess, display. The elites are really competing with each other. But Hatshepsut, as regent, has to allow more wealth to leave her hands, more than her father ever did. She's losing power in this exchange in the long term, but in the short term, she has to do it. She has to let this, this money go. And we see during her reign, the creation of more elite positions, more official positions than at any other time. She's a jobs creator. She's got to give people jobs. It's a more elegant way of, of making sure that she stays in power and just outright giving people money. Now, as time goes on, she's there as regent, the kid's getting older, he's going to be three years old, four years old, five years old. But by the time he's like six years old, it seems that Shepsut starts to mess with the idea of kingship, starts to think about this more and more. And we actually get a text here where she's reaching for it. She's not calling herself king. She uses a little bit of legalese to go around this. So she actually says that the sun god himself, Red, has given her the kingship. She doesn't call herself king, she doesn't show herself as king, but she says, look, I'm doing the job. He's actually given me the kingship. It's a, it's a way of saying what it is she's going to soon become. And as time goes on, a couple of years later, we see her then taking on the kingship in actuality. Why she does this, and why she's eventually crowned, in her words, by Amun Re in the temple, by his own hands, why this happens is the most confusing part of the story. Why does she formalize something that's working so well? She's already there making all the decisions, acting as regent on behalf of this boy, her nephew, Timothy III. Why does she have to formalize it and jump then 
into the kingship itself, call herself king, have this weird upside down co-regency where she's acting as the primary king in a double kingship and she's a woman and she came to the throne second. Very strange thing. Did Tutmos III get sick? Was he on his deathbed and they're like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? How chefs are gonna formalize this, you need to be king? We, we have no idea. In typical Egyptian fashion, they make sure their divine kingship is shrouded in the ultimate idealization. They do not talk about distressing things or bad things or personal things. There's no gossip. People aren't talking about the lovers of the kings. They're not talking about those details that we so want to know. All of that is shrouded from our eyes. So we have to go with this story <clears throat> knowing that Hatshepsut lived at a certain time, with certain problems, with, with certain issues. What was her decision-making process? How would she have negotiated this, this field before her? It's a, it's a difficult thing to unravel. But she eventually does call herself king of Upper and Lower Egypt. She gives herself the throne name Mahara, and then she rules for 22 years altogether um, as king. Now, this is her and her co-king, Chitmose III, and notice how she depicts them, herself and him, as twins, almost as if they're the same person. That I am him and, and he is me, and I am masculine like him. She can't show herself as feminine next to him and have the primary position. That wouldn't work with a patriarchal society. So if she's going to take primary place with her co-king, she must show herself as masculine. She never does rule alone. She creates jobs, makes sure that her elites are, are um, satisfied with her rule, with this average and strange kingship. She makes sure she controls the money. She keeps the CEOs of the Amun Temple Institution and her own treasury as close as possible. And she has a very close relationship with this man, Senmu. So close in terms of business and working matters that people have assumed that they're lovers, even though there's no evidence for that. She has complete control of the priesthood. They love her and, and she loves them. They understand together that one of the main means of getting power is to justify it ideologically. And Hatshepsut tells us herself in her own annals that there was a moment when she was marked for power. When the god Amun-Re was placed in a bark, a little statue was placed in a bark, the priests carried him out of the temple. And this is a moment when the god leaves the temple where you can ask the god questions, you can have oracles, you can connect with the god. On this day, when the god left the temple, he was all of a sudden rudderless, and the priests didn't know where to do or what, to, what, to, what direction to take. And then all of a sudden, they picked up the bark and went this way, and that way, and this way. And who did they end up right in front of? Hatshepsut, who throws herself to the ground, raises her hands up in front of everybody, with everybody watching, and says, Oh, my father, Amun, what would you have me do? She understands more than anybody else that a woman cannot have naked ambition for power. She has to move that responsibility to the God. And she says again and again, the only reason I'm in this position is because the God has asked me to be in this position. My father Amun needs me in this position. That's the only reason. Think of uh, the last conversation you may have gotten with a, a more conservative friend of yours, and you're arguing, and the friend says, no, it can't be that way. And you're like, yes, it can. And you say, no, it can't. You say, why? And I say, because of Jesus, or Buddha, or Muhammad, or whatever. And you know you're done. As soon as religion is brought up, you're done. Michael Mann, I mentioned before, says that ideological power is the most powerful because it cannot be proven or disproven. No facts in association with this. So you bring up your ideology, Amen Ray wants me to be king. And look at the bark just like kicked me and everything. And everyone's like, okay, you should be king. So there's no way of, of moving against that justification. <clears throat> 